When I was younger, I used to think the girls were prettier on the left bank. These days, I think the buildings are. The French built this magnificent bridge to impress the Russians in the 19th century. The Parliament building. The Musée d'Orsay used to be a railway station. Now it's one of the best museums of modern art. The Institut Mazarin, which houses the Académie Française, guardians of the French language. And there it is, Notre Dame, the very heart of Paris. Great Emperor Charlemagne, who as every French school child knows, had the crazy idea of inventing school, guards Our Lady of Paris with his two companions, Olivier and Roland. Our Lady stands alone amidst the flash bulbs inside this Gothic masterpiece of a cathedral, quietly watching the constant streams of tourists, some of whom might well be hoping to catch a glimpse of Esmeralda and the Hunchback. This magnificent building has not only inspired countless Christians over the centuries, but authors, musicians and artists as well. Dayroll is one of the oldest taxidermists in Paris. Once, before wildlife films on television were shown, it used to supply stuffed animals to schools for nature lessons. Nowadays, their main customers are interior decorators. Once, the pollen from these blue butterflies was used in the green printing ink of the dollar bill. Who knows what these customers were looking for in this extraordinary shop? The moose was tempting, but perhaps a little large. In the end, they seemed to plump for a fine antelope's head. Perhaps they were going to put it in their bathroom and hang towels on its horns. Maybe they just liked dead animals watching them round the house. I wonder if I'll get stuffed. Paris, by metropolitan standards, is an extremely clean city. Even the pigeons profit by the daily sluicing of the gutter. Oh. Madame Claude and Janine run a hand laundry or Saint-Germain-de-Prés. Madame Claude does the dampening down, folding an admin, while Janine dashes away with her smoothing iron all day. I asked Madame Claude why they didn't use electric irons. They told me the wires got in the way. And furthermore, with the old system, you always had an iron with the heat you needed warming around the stove. These two redoubtable ladies are hanging up their irons in three years' time, and after that their skills will be lost forever. I managed to persuade Janine, the hyphets of the tongs, to show me what advanced ironing was all about. She produced the antique bonnet for a baby that was to be christened that weekend.
c'est inadmissible. Now, this isn't an occupation that's going to make anyone rich and famous, but I bet it's a very good therapy for those who complain of stress. Voilà tout notre savoir-faire que j'adore depuis quelques années qu'on ne compte plus. All our savoir-faire, which I adore, has counted for nothing for the last few years. Saying goodbye, I walk past the Wizard of Oz lion guarding the Saint-Sulpice fountain. They say it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good. Madeleine Jelliot is one of the very oldest shops in Paris. She sells umbrellas and trade was falling off when someone discovered that if you have a whiplash injury in a car crash, you can't support the sun. So Madame Jelly sells cotton umbrellas, which are the only ones that protect the whiplash from the harmful solar rays. My next rendezvous was with a man who dyes silk, whose workshop lies behind the golden dome of Les Invalides. Next time you see a top model sashaying down the catwalks at a fashion show in Paris, think of Mr. Luge. In these rather medieval conditions, Mr. Luge and his partner dye the silks for the haute couture houses. The process is simple. You just dump the material into the dye. The pick is getting the color of the dye just right. At the moment, with infinite patience, he's getting the color to match a sample from Christian Dior. He dries his sample on the heated bar and goes to look at it in the daylight. Now, it's just Mr. Lucius's eyes which keep him in business. He has to go back at least 10 times to get the color just right, adding a little bit more yellow each time. Mr. Luch's partner gets his piece of mauve silk just right. They charge about $100 for dyeing a piece of material, which seems rather reasonable to me. Hand dyes of silk have been dyeing fabric like this for at least 600 years, so there probably isn't a better way. One last test, and I thought it must be it. It looked just about perfect to me, but no, it still needed a bit more yellow. At last, Mr. Lush declared himself satisfied. <laughs> B. 
These small family businesses in France can just about keep going, but they can't afford to train anyone, so they'll soon disappear. The modern municipal offices of Paris are a bureaucratic lot, so it was a pleasant surprise to come across something a little crazy. The annual waiter and waitresses race, which has been going on since the 1930s. <laughs> These gorgeous girls had to run round Paris with three glasses and a bottle of mineral water on a tray. The excitement mounted, they were off. Over the Pont de Carousel, along the Quai Voltaire, and up the Rue de Saint-Père, they raced. I had my eye on number 295, who seemed like a likely lad. All was going well as he ran down Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Unfortunately, as he turned into the boulmy, she stumbled. Ain't that always the way? Past Notre Dame they ran, but by this time, some of the competitors had altogether abandoned their style. She will certainly get full marks for not spilling a single drop. The Cossacks brought the word bistro to Paris after Napoleon's defeat in Moscow. It means, I want my food, quick. So next time your order is a long time coming, it may be that your weight has been practicing for this grueling derby. Here's a perfect example of what goes up must come down. In a quiet Parisian courtyard, I met Lison de Cohn, who is a maître d'art of marquetry made of straw. I discovered an extraordinary world with a superb craft which dates from the 17th century, and above all, a craft which was dead. There was nobody doing it. The collections were in the vaults of the museums. People had beautiful things in their cupboards, but there was no one to restore them. The art was well on the way of being forgotten. I threw myself into the world of straw marketry. France has the best straw marketry. There's some in Holland and in England, where it was made by the Napoleonic prisoners of war. Most of the straw marquetry in the 19th century was made by prisoners. The craft was an ideal one for prisoners because the materials cost nothing and it was very time consuming and they had plenty of time. I get these bundles of straw and then I dye them in a fish steamer. When that's done, I open the straw and flatten it out, so I'm left with bits 30 centimeters long and one centimeter wide. It's with these bits that I make my marquetry. The principle is exactly the same as wood marquetry.
I stick the straw onto a backing of either paper or wood. Je prépare des petites, vraiment des petits plaquages qui sont faits avec des pailles de couleurs différentes. When you open it, you see how the straw shines. I'm going to put back an antique mirror there. It's a little writing box. I shall put in crystal inkwells. This is in extremely good condition. The extraordinary thing about straw marquetry is that absolutely everything is covered with marquetry. All the drawers and the bottoms of the drawers. This is a very typical piece of 19th century straw marquetry. My sister-in-law, Angelica, told me how to make ratatouille as we walked down the boulevard Saint-Germain. She's the mother of four and an extremely good cook. Angelica's ingredients are very simple. One kilo of each of the following. Tomatoes, aubergines, onions, courgettes and peppers. And then sunflower. This is sunflower, yes. And can be olive oil. Mm. So that it heats while what, I cut. Why do you have four pans, Angela? Because I don't have. I must cook everything separately. That's the golden rule. Yes, this is the main rule because if you don't put it, cook it separately, it makes a puree. So one kilo, one kilo uh, aubergine. Mm -hmm. I cut them in slices, and then I'll put them in the pan with oil. I start with the aubergine because it takes more time to to cook. I asked Angelica if the tomatoes Not were done. Yet, no. Little bit pepper. Just, you know, a little bit, a bit uh, light, more lighter and, and, and souple. And when it's ready, it should be put in an earthenware pan, which is a traditional pen in south of France. Does that change the taste, do you think? Yes. That yeah, looks very good indeed. I hope so. <coughs> Thank you. It was delicious, Angelica. And you feel it's different. At the foot of the Pantheon lie the Luxembourg Gardens. At one end, the powerful fountain of the four rivers stands between vast hedges of trees. Film girls will remember the horses from the film of Colette Gigi. As I strolled through the dappled sunlight under the trees, I thought how clever it was of the French to have such an agreeable park in the heart of their capital city. The grounds are liberally scattered with statues. And the Senate, the upper house of the French parliament, lies right by the sailing pond. My favourite sculpture in the whole of Paris has its own bower in one corner of the gardens. It tells the myth of Polypheme, one of the Cyclops, who was madly in love with Nerida. She, of course, fancied Assis, a young shepherd. In this tableau, Polypheme, mad with jealousy, is about to crush his rival with a stone. <coughs> Around the corner from the park, Another person with a positive passion, Mr. Ara, has his shop. Mr. Ara was a qualified chemist when the course of his life changed suddenly. And what's a nice chemist like you making, restoring beautiful lamps like this? Well, how did that happen? Well, it started with a lamp I found uh, beside a, a bin, a yes. trash can. In Istanbul? In Germany. In Germany. I was a student then. And... Uh, I like to use it and wired it uh, again and uh, it was a beautiful princess uh, in the middle of uh, 
my students' uh, room, and I started going to the flea market and collected some random parts and uh, combined them to, to, to new old lamps. And so it started uh, as, a, as a passion, as a collection, and uh, it ended up as a new uh, professional perspective for my future. They do. They do. It's uh, something very different than uh, uh, cold electric uh, lighting. Mm. It is. Uh, um, you can hear this light. You can feel the presence of, of uh, almost a person. Yes. It's not an anonymous uh, object. Women must regret very much that they don't have this light to sit by. Well, they can have this light. <laughs> they can sit by it uh, if they choose. If they want it, uh, it's up on uh, themselves. Uh, they, they can. Buy yes. new or old lamps today, it's not a problem. Yes. This is the so called uh, Bat's Wing Burner, the most primitive uh, burner ever used in early 19th century. I just pull on the chain and uh, light it. Yes, please. So, a further. A further development in the history of uh, gas lighting, yeah. the organt burner, a circular double air draft burner, invented by Awa von Welsbach uh, around 1885. Uh, it uses a very hot blue flame, uh, the, the so called Bunsen. Mm. After that was the electric light bulb invention. Electric lighting was already there, yeah. and it was also the very reason why the gas lighting progressed. It was a challenge, and the gas industry had to reply to that challenge. It is the last old-fashioned free pissoir on the left bank, and a very popular place it is too. The French like to spend their francs prudently. People will drive miles out of their way to use it. Le Pont des Arts on July the 14th, Bastille, was the venue for the big picnic, a junket organized by a bottled water company. We were all meant to sit on a very long tablecloth they had provided, which came in very handy later. Anne-Marie, my neighbor, told me of a good accordion bar, and someone gave me a hard-boiled egg to pass to David Turner, whoever he was. Il est chaud. Il est pas mort, il y a du It might have been France's national day, but it certainly turned into a very English picnic as the rain poured down at the end.
That was quite a night at the Vendée Rouge.